if I were preaching in a traditional African-American church, you would be used to call and response. For instance, if I called God is good, the response would be all the time. And then if I called all the time, the response would be God is good. This is so true. How does God demonstrate his goodness to his people? Uh, let's begin to investigate this by turning together to Acts chapter 14. The background is Paul and Barnabas had been at Lystra. Uh, they heal a cripple, and as a result of that, the people want to de They want to make gods out of Paul and Barnabas. So we've got some trouble brewing here in Acts chapter 14. Let me go ahead and read Acts 14, 14 through 17 to you. And just before I read this section of Scripture, why does God do good? Would you think about that? Why does God do good? Here we go. Verse 14. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you, and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God, who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for our continuation of the series of the attributes of God. Now we look at the second communicable attribute, that you are good and that you want us to imitate you. So, Father, please grace our study today for your glory, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Why does God do good? If I called that out to you, why does God do good? Your response should be from Psalm 119 and verse 68. You are good and you do good. So how do you perceive the goodness of an invisible God? Well, he gave us five senses, sight, smell, hearing, taste, and touch. Question, and this is an important one, have you ever eaten a pupusa? (laughs) A pupusa. Uh, By the way, November 13th is National Pupusa Day in El Salvador, and that's where I was first turned on to pupusa. So I gave a little write-up. Pupusa is a tortilla made of corn flour stuffed with various things like cheese, pork, and beans. The pupusa is stuffed while forming the tortilla. It is culinary art form, and not everyone can make them. It takes skill and practice to be able to make them. They are so good. (laughs) So when I mean my pupusa, I use my five senses. First of all, sight. It's when your eyes begin to bulge out of your head. <laughs> and then smell. You got to you gotta take in the aroma at that point, which, by the way, will cause you, as it did to me, to salivate. And then hearing. You can hear it sizzling. And it's speaking to me. Now, I'm not sure the language pupusas talk, but most likely it's in Spanish. And then touch. You got to move away from the gringo knife and fork. You get the touch the pupusa, and you eat it using your fingers. And then finally, taste for that out-of-body experience. So we use our five senses to perceive the goodness of God. Here is point number one for today's sermon. Number one, contemplate the goodness of God. Contemplate the goodness of God From the very beginning, at creation, God modeled his goodness to mankind. Six times in Genesis chapter 1, verse 4, verse 10, verse 12, verse 18, verse 21, and verse 25, after God looks over his creation, he says, it is good. The Hebrew 
tov. It is good. And then he gives us this statement after the sixth day of creation, after he had made man. This is Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. Tov, ma'ov. And by the way, this sets up the stage for Genesis chapter 2, when we have the words lo, tov, not good. What was not good? That man should be alone. The spouse is a compliment to the husband, testifying to the goodness of God. By the way, every, every good gift comes from above. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So every good gift comes from the Father above. Let's think about some of God's gifts. Let's contemplate these together, if you will. How about the gift of salvation? What a wonderful gift. We would be headed to hell for an eternity if it were not for the gift of salvation. Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, the goodness of God leads you to repentance. The goodness of God leads you to repentance, to place your faith in the finished work of Christ. What a great gift. It's an indescribable gift, as Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 15. Then we have the gift of forgiveness. Consider Psalm 86 in verse 5. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive. He's a merciful God. In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us, not from some, but all unrighteousness the gift of forgiveness, in order that not only could we have a forgiveness of sins initially at salvation, but then to maintain that right relationship with our Heavenly Father. Then we have the gift of worship. Turn to the middle of your Bible. That's about Psalm 117. But I'd like you to go with me, please, to Psalm 100. Uh, perhaps you've heard Psalm 100 read or preached during a Thanksgiving service, which is very Appropriate Psalm 100, coming down now to verses 4 and 5. We're told, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Notice the word for. The little Hebrew conjunction, he, gives us the reason. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Question, is God good even during your difficult times? Consider Joseph and everything he had gone through. After his father passes away, the brothers are concerned that Joseph will turn on them. But this is what Joseph says in Genesis 50 in verse 20. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Do some things work together for good or all things? Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. I can remember I'd been in a ministry for some years, and two of my sons, my eldest, Josh, and my youngest, Kenny, now Pastor Kenny, the associate at the church, uh, took a, a group of young people to McDonald's after having music practice at the church. They were doing good things. They were singing songs to the Lord, headed to McDonald's. When they had entered into McDonald's and were going up to the register, a man came in with a large weapon had everybody move to one portion of the store and then robbed the store, went through the registers. Can you imagine how petrified everyone was? Now, I just want you to think about, my sons had done nothing wrong. They had been at the right place, church, singing the right music, Christian songs, and then 
happened to be at McDonald's at this moment? Is God good then? And I'll give you a second illustration considering the goodness of God. And by the way, everyone was safe through the situation. So we praise God, of course, for that. I was a decade into my ministry. I was going to have a Bible study with the mayor of the town and her husband, an African-American couple. I was in my study at the church, and as I was in the study, someone came knocking on my door and said, Pastor, the mayor is out front and needs you immediately. I went out, I took a look, and there we had what? Two groups, gangs, if you will, on each side of the street. So what did I do? went back into the study and prayed. (laughs) Just joking. Immediately went into the middle of the group there and tried to help my mayor mediate this gang dispute that was going on. Uh, By the way, we had spent hours there. Uh, The police were dispatched, but they did not come because they had heard that there was going to be an attempt on their lives uh, through the Salvadoran gang, MS-13. So we, we worked through that. And by the way, the, the skirmish occurred because we had a nuisance home uh, adjacent to the church. Uh, a couple of young ladies that drew the wrong kind of people in had got this other group of people mad. And so you had opposition on both sides of the street. The mom uh, of one of these ladies had come over to me and said, Pastor, I'm not going to be intimidated. I'm not going to leave the community. No one can put me out of the house. Well, after several hours, the police came. Both groups disbanded. One large group (laughs) went into the one home. And I often joke that if Pittsburgh were lacking steel, they could have patted down the individuals going in that home, and they would have had plenty of steel uh, to keep them in business. But thinking about these things, I took the mayor Uh, We went into the church, I knelt down, and I prayed, dear God, either convert these people or have them move out of the town. Uh, I got a call the next day that God had answered my prayers, not the way I thought. Uh, Someone had driven by the house and shot it up, and sure enough, the lady who had said, we're never leaving, I've never seen her. Why? Because she packed up her family. Thankfully, I believe no one was hurt and moved out. See, in the former situation with my two sons at McDonald's, I really don't know why that happened. But God maintained his goodness throughout that situation. And then later on with the second illustration, uh, I do understand more of why that happened. Because you had the white pastor stand with the black mayor, and then people from the town started to hear these things. And we started to have a lot more African-Americans come in to the church. This I know, regardless what is going on, we praise God because all things work together for good. So we got to contemplate the goodness of God. Number two, let us illustrate the goodness of God. To, to illustrate means you become a picture. We are saved in order to serve our God. So if you'd make your way over to the book of Titus with me, please, right past Timothy, over to Titus. And as you're turning to Titus, let me bring to your memory verses you know well, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, for you are saved by grace, correct? Yes, God's favor upon your life. What was the tool, the instrument that God used for you to receive that salvation, it was faith. But then after we're saved, it says in Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, his poema. I hear that ma ending, we have the English term poem (laughs) that derives from the Greek, and then the ma ending means result. It carries the idea, the result. You are the result of God's work. So therefore, now we are called unto good works. And let's scan Titus quickly and see some of the highlights emphasizing this. Let me read to you Titus chapter 2, 6 through 7. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded, in all things showing yourself to be a pattern of what? Good works. In doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, 
incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say about you or even to you. Okay, that's Titus 2, 6 through 7. More familiar verses later in Titus. Come down to verse 11. Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Salvation is universally available. It's personified here as the salvation comes to life. What does it do? Teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that substitutionary atonement. He gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. And catch the end of verse 14, zealous for what? Good works. May I ask you, are you zealous for good works? You've been saved in order to serve our God, and then you need to do so with a passion. It's what we are called to do. Recall when Jesus went into the temple. Twice he did this and had to purge his father's home. First, the beginning of ministry is recorded in John 2, and then the other gospels give us the story of the latter cleansing toward the end of Jesus's ministry. And as he went in, he drove out all those profiteers. They were charging too much money to give supplies to the pilgrims who had traveled in to Jerusalem as an obedient act, according to Deuteronomy 16, 16. So Jesus was furious. He made a cord of whips and he drove them out. And as the disciples were watching him, they recall from Psalm 69 that the zeal of your house has eaten you up. That's right. He was passionate about his father's house and serving as God and wanted to do so with the utmost of integrity. I pray that we carry that same zeal. It's something we're called to do. Now, to wrap this up over in Titus 3, come down with me, please, to verse 8, and then we'll see verse 14 to wrap up this little section in Titus. This is a faithful saying and these things I want to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to what? Maintain good works, a pattern of good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Verse 14, and let our people also learn to maintain good works. Emphasized over and over and over again, maintain good works. We need to be about good works works. Listen to 3 John 11. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil. Contrast, notice the word but, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. And you should know, not to do good is sin. That's what James pens in chapter 4 and verse 17. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. We have the Bible. It instructs us that we need to have a pattern of good works. We need to carry the zeal of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be individuals who have this pattern of good works. But when we don't do what God has called us to do, then it is sin. It is missing God's standard. It's missing the mark that he has established for us. And how is it that we can have as fallen creatures a pattern of good works? Well, the fruit of the Spirit shows us that when we are seeking after God, when we are yielding to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit produces a goodness in our lives. Let's consider that together. Over to the book of Galatians with me, please. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 is in the sanctification section 
of the book. In other words, we're looking at how to progress in a relationship with Jesus Christ because we are marked out ahead of time, that's Romans 8, 29, to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We are called to imitate the nature of our God. Since he is good, we are called to practice goodness, but it can only happen divinely as we abide in him because he works through us through the person of the Holy Spirit. Down here in Galatians 5, verse 16, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Let me just read on. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So you're going to be in one of two realms spiritually abiding in the Almighty and not submitting to the lust of the flesh or walking in the flesh and therefore producing the works of the flesh in contrast to the fruit of the Spirit. I mentioned earlier about the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, Notice that the word fruit is singular. It's talking about these nine graces as a package deal. So in Galatians 5, Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, it's possible grammatically to put a colon after love and that the other eight graces describe love. Or it can be showing just these individuals, but love is placed first for a reason. Why? 1 Corinthians 13, 13, and now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, here's her term, goodness. See, it's something that's produced by the Spirit of God. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. We need to be individuals who are walking in the Spirit. John's term might be abide. It makes no difference whether you use abide from John or walk from Paul. It's the same concept. You remain in the realm, in the sphere of being pleasing to God because you're yielding to him, desirous that he worked through you to accomplish these things. And then let me give you another verse, and this is one I'd encourage you to memorize, I have. It's a verse you should put in your mind because we have to be looking for opportunities to serve our God. We need to be actively seeking for any open door that God would give to us in order that we could please him by serving others. Here we go. This is Galatians chapter 6 in verse 10. Let me read this to you. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Uh, Zero in on the word opportunity. It's kairos. It's hard to translate. It's the word season. It's not chronos, which gives us chronology and the moving of time. This is the word that means a season, but can imply an opportunity. It's an opportune time to do something. And that's why I say we need to be looking for those open doors where God has moved in order that we can serve others. As we therefore have opportunity, notice here what Paul pens, let us do good to some, to the people we like, to the majority. No, it says, let us do good to all. That's the nature of God. His goodness had been displayed there in Lystra to the wicked and then also to the good. And that's the nature of our God. He's good and he does good. And we need to imitate him in his goodness. So let us do good to all, but there's a priority that's given here, especially to those who are of the household of faith, to those who are of the household of faith. So Christian, we have an obligation 
to prioritize our brothers and sisters in Christ. The word brother, adelphos, means from the same womb. Spiritually, we come from the same womb in the sense through the blood of Christ, he has eternally linked us together as family. So we become the priority. As we are considering what to do with our resources, whether time or money, we are to give priority to our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what Paul is telling us to do here. See, he's good. He's good. Several years ago, I was uh, at Bethesda Baptist Church, uh, Northeast DC. I had prayed for decades that we would have some impact on our nation's capital, Washington DC. Uh, so there was a brother who had come to us uh, who was going to candidate eventually and become the pastor of the church, uh, Pastor Michael Thompson. He came to my son and me and said, can you train me for ministry? I want to be ordained under your ministry. We were related. Uh, it's so special uh, because here we are, Comer Manor Bible Church, about one mile away from the line, the border of Washington, D.C., with a strong desire to impact the nation's capital, one of the most, if not the most, influential cities in the world. And what does God graciously do to answer our prayers? Gives us a pastor to train. He had asked me to come in to do a seminar, and I was glad to do it. At the time, it was on the book of Revelation. And I recall so vividly, there was a point I was trying to make, and we had all these tables surrounding the lectern where I was teaching. So I walked right into the middle of the room to make my point from Revelation chapter 2. And as I made a point, one of the men by the name of John yelled, boom! <laughs> we all broke out into laughter. It was a boom moment for John because something had become very clear to him and it was as if the Spirit of God had turned on the light switch to give illumination, and he got it. So he didn't keep in his emotion, and I love that about the African-American community. I, I, whenever I'm there, you can pick me out usually. I'm the only one that's tall, light, and handsome. Uh, it's a purely, right now, African-American church, and I'm the only white guy in the premises at times. But we had a boom moment. And I'm thinking, that's what God wants. As you and I contemplate the goodness of God, as we take the time and consider that he not only is good, but he does good, and we take a survey of our lives and we focus upon the many times we can remember where he displayed his goodness to us, we should have that boom moment because his goodness, his goodness is from his eternally gracious and good nature. So as we contemplate the goodness of God, Lord, help us to be those who experience that boom moment that forever changes us. But then we need to illustrate the goodness of God. There's a world out there that's looking for truth. The Spirit of God, as we are told, when he comes, he was going to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So the world is under conviction of the Holy Spirit. Here, you and I are child of God, and what are we to be? We are to be the illustration. We are to be a picture of the goodness of God. So as we go out and serve people, as we have that opportunity, and we take advantage of the opportunity God has given, when we have that zeal like the Lord Jesus Christ had in his service to the Father, as we're told from uh, Titus 2 in verse 14, zealous for good works, and people see that, perhaps they have the boom moment, that they see the nature of our God, the invisible God, through the kind and the good deeds we are doing for his great name's sake. So let's contemplate the goodness of God, and then may we illustrate the goodness of God. All right, would you join me in prayer, 
please. Father, you are good and you do good. And I thank you for your goodness. I thank you that you are God, that as it says from the scriptures, you are good. You're eternally good. And because you are good, you have to demonstrate your goodness. And you have done that through sending us your son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sin and was raised from the dead. When we put our faith in him, we have that gift of salvation. And then we have the gift of the forgiveness of sins when we transgress the commandments of our holy God. Help us, Lord, to contemplate. Help us to illustrate the goodness of God that we might be able to experience that boom moment individually and then help others to have that same experience. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching today's sermon. Uh, there is a book that is the basis for the 14 lessons, Attributes of God on Fire. Uh, there are actually 10 other fire books. Or you can learn more about us at comermanorbiblechurch.com. And then I have a foundation, Ken J. Bird Senior Foundation.com. And finally, we have a father and son podcast. We would love to have you join us. God bless you.